Um, let's just start off and getting right to it and want to go to questions, so please make sure you have questions for the audience. Um, we're in a really tricky, tricky point right now. People say we're hitting an inflection point in policy when it comes to, we have different types of speech, disinformation, there's a con you know, concept that um, hate groups are getting away with everything and there's all different types of content. Are we at the point where we're going to have to um, look at serious regulation in the space? And if so, what would that look like? Um, at least domestically, and we can get to the international issues in just a bit. So, yeah, thanks for thanks for having me, Tim. You know, l let's take a step back. And I was having a conversation with some of my colleagues in other parts of the country. A friend of mine just came in from Arkansas the other day, and he said to me, "You know what? Nobody's really talking about that much in Arkansas. The government shut down." I was like, "Whoa, that's, that's crazy!" Because that's all anybody talks about. My neighbors, my newspapers, my Twitter, my Facebook feeds—everything talks about the government shutdown. And it made me realize that even here in the district, we have the tendency to live in our own echo chambers. We sometimes think that things are bigger deals than they are seen in other parts of the country and other parts of society. So, you know, you're talking about hate speech and moderating content, and uh, the premise of this panel is, you know, what do we do when everybody's stuck in their own echo chambers type scenario? And I think one of the important things that we need to do is take a moment and recognize that we ourselves are stuck in our own self-created, inside the beltway echo chamber. Now, taking a step back on the issue of content moderation writ large, I'm just gonna kind of jump to the, the elephant in the room and, and I come from a conservative background. That's kind of where I am on, this, on the political spectrum. And a number of my conservative allies are yelling at me about content moderation and what they are calling deplatforming of content, removing conservative content from platforms. And they say, how can, Carl, how can you support this? You know, they're removing types of statements that you would support or, or may support. They're, they're harming the conservative movement. And I say to my friends and colleagues, it's important to recognize that one of the most fundamental provisions of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which is what Tim spoke about, is the Good Samaritan provision. And what that allows platforms to do is remove what they consider to be objectionable content. If I am running the equivalent of Twitter for dogs and I decide to deplatform cat videos, then that should be okay. If I am running some other service and I decide some sort of content, whether it's hate speech, whether it's pornography, whether it's something else, is not appropriate for my users, then it is my right as that platform to remove that content. And whether we're seeing it from liberal or conservative, I think it's important to recognize that the freedom of speech and the freedom to do what's best for your customers on those platforms should kind of be valued and be maintained so that we can actually have a more civil discourse in those various platforms on which we operate. So uh, that, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think other people have different views that the type of content that we're, we've had on these platforms. And by the way, when we created State of the Net 15 years ago, like we weren't doing content moderation panels. We had MySpace. Yeah, yeah we, weren't, we weren't doing that at all. We're in a different environment. Things have changed dramatically. Um, you know, other people are a little upset with the type of content that's out there. And these internet platforms are becoming the commons. Um, it is a digital commons, um, I've heard said. So it, there, there has to be, some people are saying there has to be something done. I, I looked like Henry and say like, what, what's the solution here? Sure, well, I, I guess uh, I'm staunchly a progressive and we are pretty much in a very yeah, similar that's place. Yeah, fantastic. Right? Um, See, we agree. <laughs> Bipartisanship <laughs> in the district. So uh, it's over, uh, go home. Uh, so. Uh, look, we're talking about um, really serious problems, not in the abstract, right? And so uh, my work um, at the Center for American Progress has been focused around addressing uh, issues of hate uh, online um, and building a, uh, with some colleagues from um, Southern Poverty Law Center and Free Press, um, a coalition of civil and human rights groups, uh, about 50 organizations, um, to uh, develop a strategy to be responsive uh, to uh, hate online and to understand it um, before developing that strategy. So we spent about a year uh, really examining um, the field, working with uh, experts who agreed with us, didn't agree with us um, on a wide variety of policy issues here in the United States, um, as well as in Europe and Africa and Asia, 
And um, the, the, so I'm going to agree um, uh, with uh, the points that were already made and not restate those. And I, I, what I want to say, though, is I think th these, are, these are serious, non-theoretical problems. So let's start with that. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, um, if we uh, look at whether it was uh, the work um, or the, the organizing work that was done um, by alt-right and neo-Nazi groups in uh, Charlottesville, um, that, uh, that organizing was done using uh, traditional mainstream tools, um, uh, tools owned by some of the sponsors um, behind, uh, behind us here. Um, and, uh, and the effort was funded using mainstream tools. Uh, and there's reasons uh, that the same is true if we look at how someone like Dylan Roof, who went on a murder spree at a um, Mother Emanuel AME church in, uh, in South Carolina, um, he was indoctrinated online. Um, and so our, what we looked at was uh, how were these tools being used and what were their implications. Um, and uh, it's important to understand uh, as well that this is not just domestic. Uh, we, we, uh, tools like WhatsApp and Facebook um, were uh, cited by uh, the UN with regard to um, uh, mass human rights uh, issues in, uh, and attacks on human rights in Myanmar, um, in India. So th these are, are serious issues that need to be addressed not because they have abstract implications, but they're really killing people. Um, I want to make sure everybody else talks, so I'll, I'll finish um, uh, with this thought. Um, why, does, why does hate organize online, and why have hate groups always been early adopters of technology? Um, internet tools allow hate groups to do things that, uh, that really are important to them. Like everybody, they got to find a way to pay for their activities, um, and uh, tools that allow, that, that allow you to raise money, whether it's crowdsourcing or PayPal or Stripe online, um, make that rapid and make it with a very short paper trail. Um, they also need to have anonymity. On the right and the left in the United States, uh, uh, you know, if, if you go into an office place or, or this sort of thing, holding ideas that are, uh, that are hateful are, are not acceptable, right? And so, uh, Anonymity allows you uh, to engage in that hateful activity um, uh, and get outside that problem. And it allows you to recruit new members. Um, because if I was to say, hey, I'm starting a neo-Nazi rally next week in this room, it's pretty likely all of you guys would shun me and I'd lose my job. But the tools allow me to, to address the fact that uh, I need to be able to reach a much larger geographic area um, to find uh, haters than just this room or just this town, right? Um, and then finally, um, the tools allow us uh, or allow uh, evildoers, um, whether they're uh, terrorist organizations, uh, international terrorist organizations, or domestic hate groups, um, to use a methodical approach uh, and the researchers that we work with uh, that in the terrorist space explain this, um, use a methodical approach to indoctrinate um, particularly young males. Um, so they, these are a set of tools that are essential um, in that workplace. I'm going to shut up because I think there will be other questions. Yeah, I, I, but I, I think we stopped short on And none of us have answered your questions, but that's No, okay. no, no one's, <laughs> they might have been terrible questions. But they, I think we're in, we're in Washington. We can see um, all the, 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 mecha the, the, the mechanics of government here. The question I think relevant for this space is, um, are we at a point where something has to be done or do we just do nothing and just hope that things work out and that um, the Section 230 um, rules that um, internet companies operate under allow them to, they'll get a hold of this um, issue and, and it'll be better. Um, what, what we had an inflection point, I'd look to Gail or to Daphne, what, what has to be done? I'll go. Yeah, please. Okay. So, um, so a couple of things first. Thank you and congratulations because this was not easy for you, the build up to this with the government shutdown. And, and he's a true pro and he kept it all together. And here we all are. So kudos, Tim. And, and also on a related note to the USG colleagues who are in the room and I, I recognize some faces. Welcome back. We missed you. <laughs> I was rattling around EOB on my own 
practically for <laughs> a few weeks there. Um, and and, uh, and so I'm, I greatly miss the interagency colleagues, but we're back now. Um, so uh, one of the colleagues who was rattling around EOB with me was uh, Matt Lyra, and he has this great expression. Um, I'm going to go a bit meta here, <laughs> so, um, so if you'll indulge me. Um, so let's go back to mid-1990s, as Tim alluded to. Um, yeah, so as Tim alluded to, we had, um, you know, we had a couple of big decisions made uh, back in the day, and, and, and they all led up to this sort of construct that is known as internet regulation. Maybe regulation's not the right word. Um, but we had, coming out of the administration, the 1997 blueprint, um, which essentially said, um, you know, that let the market figure most of this out, okay? And it, and it was built on the premise that this would be a marketplace of ideas, but also a marketplace defined by robust competition, low entry barriers, and so on. Um, so that's kind of thing number one. Thing number two were two significant acts of Congress. Um, if you want to call CDA an act of Congress, it was like the tail end of what was left after another act of Congress was reversed by the Supreme Court. But um, so we had CDA and we had DMCA 512. And these combined are considered sort of the fundamental building blocks of the, 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 the internet as we know it today. And, um, but that was back then. Uh, we fast forward to today, um, and I'm going to do a little quiz here. Um, hands up if you ever used Alta Vista as your primary search engine. It's not, it's a few, few people in the front row here. Most of the room did not. Um, do you remember the sound of dial-up modem? <laughs> <laughs> okay, still not quite everybody. Um, I remember sending my first email. I, I think there are probably in the room people in the room who don't. So my point here is that was then, this is now, um, and the technology has moved on. Um, at the moment in time when this construct was put in place, we didn't have social media. Um, Mark Zuckerberg was maybe 15, um, and, and things have changed in the marketplace since then. And some of these assumptions have been tested and so on. Um, and, and I say that at sort of a meta level because I think it feeds into the discussion today. And so to Tim's question, I'm going to try and answer your question, Tim. Are we at an inflection point? <coughs> Um, I, I, I don't, I'm not here to be prescriptive. Um, I, I wish I had had a chance to check in with the interagency colleagues before I, I talked here today. So I'm not representing this as like fully baked administration policy. But I think that you know, we started with privacy last year. Um, that was part of the initial construct. The construct said privacy will go to the FTC under its Section 5 framework. It will be by enforcement and so on. And, and we all know, and, and we're not a privacy panel, but I'll just allude to it, that that constructs come under strain, or at least that part of the construct. And, and we're working through that process. And we're now at a point in time where, for the first time in, in the nation's history, where everybody seems to be talking about the need for comprehensive privacy legislation for the first time, right? And so, so I'll just, I'll leave it at that, but I just wanted to set the table by going a little meta first. So, so Daphne, if, uh, if regulation is coming, if, if it's the end of the arrow when it comes to hands off, um, already Congress has put a hole in Section 230 last year for uh, human trafficking reasons. Um, what do you think that looks like and, um, and, and what are the dangers of that? So there's something about the opportunity to regulate the internet that makes lawyers like forget our training, you know? <laughs> like, we, we all see this blank slate issue where we get to make up rules, and that's kind of scary. Um, because really, the training we should be remembering is we all went to law school, we all took, well, we, lawyers all went to law school, <laughs> by <laughs> definition. We took final exams, and you like, you issue spot, and you say, here's a harm, here's a harm, is there a law for that? Yes, no, here's what the law does already. Um, and, and I think we tend to skip that process. And it, it's not that there is no need for new laws. I think lots of new laws are coming, and many of them will be good ideas. But if we don't look carefully at what's already there, we, we won't narrowly identify what it is that, that needs to be fixed. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I see happening is that we are not 
humble enough and not s humble enough about the ways that our fields intersect when platform regulation comes up. Um, so I'm a recovering privacy lawyer. I think I can use this example. Like pl privacy lawmakers, like the people who crafted the GDPR, can be blind to the ways that out at the edges this is going to affect competition policy or this is going to affect online communication and speech policy, um, both of which I think happened with the GDPR in a way that the drafters didn't intend. Uh, Deirdre earlier was talking about civil rights law, consumer protection law. Like very often we set out to solve a problem with the tools we have, privacy law, speech law in my case, and, and, and we don't realize there are these adjacent areas of law that already speak to it. Um, so that's sort of my, my plea <laughs> to the lawmakers in the room. Go, go through that exercise, think about those intersections. Um, when it comes to content regulation or platform regulation, there's this dialogue, I think this room is too sophisticated to have, but th there's this idea that like, well, platforms need to be like media and be regulated like media or otherwise they need to stop having algorithms and stop ranking things and just be like the telephone company. And I think both of those ideas get you pretty quickly to some place that I, I don't think anybody wants to be. You know, if, if Twitter or Facebook worked like broadcast or newspapers, none of us could post anything until after their lawyers vetted it. Right, like the, the whole function of these platforms as mediums for massive communication from individuals to other individuals and people sending baby pictures to families or you know, posting their political opinions, all of that goes away if platforms are like old media. At the other end, if platforms are like the telephone company and they're completely hands off and they don't rank anything, that's like the internet in 1993. That's like before Alta Vista. You know, you, you can't find things. There aren't recommendations. If there, there's content and you can get it if you already know about it, uh, but otherwise you're out of luck. So I, I don't think anybody really wants either of those things. And that leads to the question of, well, what, what is in between? Um, and there, I think there, there's, there's a lot of there there. Like th there are legal models all over the world from countries that have handled intermediary liability in different <laughs> ways. There are empirical research troves. I maintain a um, blog post of these on the Stanford CIS site documenting the empirical problems with over removal in notice and takedown systems. There are human rights recommendations about how to correct for that through things like having counter notice or things like having the rules for one kind of intermediary not be the same as the rules for a different kind of intermediary. Uh, there are approaches that are about treati treating different kinds of speech torts and crimes differently. There's a lot out there. Um, so you know, wh whether U.S. regulation, I don't know, it's going somewhere, but there, there's a lot to know already and we don't need to draw on a blank slate. Okay, so you're saying regulation is hard, um, and we'll get to the international examples. No one here knows that. <laughs> we'll get to the international <laughs> examples soon because that's, that's actually, we have more case studies to look at, right? But let's just stay domestically for a moment. Um, I, I, and I can't believe how poorly written this panel title is. <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed about that. Um, but in the panel title somewhere is amplification. Right. Um, sometimes we talk about um, amplification as you ha you don't have a right to amplification, um, but some of these platforms actually really amplify speech in ways that we would never have imagined um, when you know in, in mass media. Um, now anybody can have their speech amplified using a variety of different tools, whether it be advertising or um, uh, different types of bots. Is, is, that, is that a problem? Is the amplification side of, of this type of content problem the problem? And is that manageable without regulation? So, uh, Tim, you can use this one. Oh, thanks. So going back to your, your prior supposition and then answering this question, you said, you know, we need to do something. That assumes that we're not doing anything now, which, I mean, to go back to your point about you had a whole day symposium on content moderation, and it gets into the issues that that Henry was raising on taking down offensive and objectionable speech. And just earlier when I started, I was talking about removing what platforms find as objectionable or hate speech or stuff that their users don't want. So 
the assumption that we need to do something, but let's recognize we are doing something now and let's, let's take that in, into effect. Now, getting to the next issue before us, which, uh, sorry, I blanked on the question as I was making my point, which was, <laughs> thank you, amplification, yes. Um, you know, one of the things that keeps being used is the phrase tool, right? The internet's a tool. Let's, let's take a moment and think about that. So email is great so that I can communicate with Daphne, but email can also become abusive. I can use it to spam people. So what did we do? We passed a law called the Can Spam Act, right? So as a tool, we need to kind of take a step back and recognize that it can be used either way. And, and you know, as we go forward, we do need to recognize that when it comes to amplification, there are great uses of amplification, right? Let's use the, the breakout hit for Twitter, right? The picture of the miracle on the Hudson, right? That was amplification. That was where somebody took a picture, posted it to Twitter, and that message went, at the time it wasn't used viral, but it went viral at the time. That's amplification of a great, amazing story. Now, amplification likewise can be used in a negative way. So that's why we talk about content moderation. That's why you have these day-long symposiums of why we all engage in this type of system so that when we see amplification of stuff that is truly offensive, that's truly reprehensible, that violates our terms of service, our contracts with the end user, that we can take it down. So yes, there's an opportunity to amplify bad speech. There's a great opportunity to amplify good speech. And without amplification, things like Arab Spring don't happen. Yeah, um, we should just, you should just have invited one of us, I think, because yeah. we're uh, very much in the same place, that, despite being on the right and the left, yeah. He's better looking. So, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I, I'm going to agree there's, there's a, a lot happening now, right, that, that companies, particularly the big companies, and I think it's important, you know, even if we look at something like the German law, which uh, could have a lot of uh, negative reactions for people here in this room, right, uh, if we look at something like the German law, um, it, it's uh, uh, reflecting um, the, the reality of that country and um, its ability to kind of push uh, internet, uh, internet companies, particularly big internet companies, um, to take on a uh, more aggressive approach consistent with their, uh, their democratic, uh, democratically chosen laws. But it applies only to big internet companies. So I think that's important, that we need to, uh, to, that in any kind of regulatory construct that's developed, we need to continue to allow smaller companies to grow and for those larger companies um, to not be able to use uh, regulatory constructs in order to create barriers to, to entry. Basically, AT&T as a model, right, the old AT&T, not the new uh, AT&T, but the old AT&T kind of figured out very early on that what it needed to do um, was to engage directly with government um, such that uh, regulation was responsive to what they thought they could actually do and um, what they thought they could build. And, they ba and that had lots of negative implications. It created a massive monopoly with all the negatives that came with that. On the other hand, it brought telephone service to every rural hamlet in the United States. So there was a trade-off and people kind of knew that. But it did stop uh, innovation coming from small companies. So what did they do? They had to actually go create Bell Labs to address this innovation uh, gap because you didn't have startups. We're probably not going to use that model. We probably shouldn't use that model. We need to not have this kind of uh, regulatory infrastructure undermine um, that. For what is happening uh, in the companies, um, that there is this uh, significant self-regulation. It's necessary for all the reasons that have been described. Um, but our work with those companies um, should really look to make that uh, self-regulation, particularly around hate speech, um, to be effective, um, fair, so real rights to appeal, um, for instance, and transparent. Because a part of the problem that we all have is that we don't actually know enough to make uh, good, strong recommendations because we don't have enough data that's available to help us make those uh, determinations. So, we might actually agree on quite a bit, but we're kind of act, uh, operating uh, in the dark, in an abstract. Um, with, with regard, finally, to amplification, um, 
that's what that, and this idea of um, we don't want to use old tools um, and, and new tools. Look, um, there are certain things we don't want amplified. And it, at start, and at CAP, we don't yet have a position on regulation, so this is me uh, saying this. Um, we can probably start with low-hanging fruit. Those things that on older technologies we believed were wrong and illegal um, shouldn't be legal on new technologies. An example of this, you shouldn't be able to limit who can buy your house to white people just because you're using Facebook. Right? That if you couldn't put an ad out that said you, uh, this house will only be rented to white people um, or only sold to white people uh, in a newspaper, you shouldn't be able to do that just because you're using a new tool. Um, that will require uh, different approaches um, in how that law is developed, but I think it's something hopefully we could most mostly agree on. And similarly, um, when it comes to uh, uh, campaign finance and, and this sort and campaign transparency, political transparency, we've built up a base of laws that we largely agree upon and that should be true as well on the internet. And on the political transparency and the political content, we're going to have a panel after this on that. Um, it, Henry jumped to the international thing, which I really want to get to, but before we do, um, I want to get some feedback from Gail and from Daphne. Um, Gail, specifically, if you could go back in your previous job, um, you spent a lot of time working on um, the human trafficking provision um, of, of FOSTA and SESTA, um, and you know, you were up on the hill working that issue. Um, there seems that, you know, Congress invented or created Section 230. They, they created it, but they don't seem to cherish it like a baby. I, there doesn't seem to be a lot of members on, up on the hill except for Senator Wyden that says, this is my baby, I want to protect it. Do you think that there's a lot of, um, uh, do you sense that there's like a, a lot up on the hill, people are willing to chip away and blow a few more holes in Section 230, and, you know, what do you think about that? So, um, so I did indeed work on SESTA. Um, the backstory there, I, I, was, I wasn't a registered lobbyist, but I did have the deep personal joy of testifying against the legislation. I saw it, it was ugly. With <laughs> like four days notice. Um, that's a very long story and not for this panel. But um, so, um, but no, I, I look, the, yes, Ron Wyden, God bless him. And, and I think there was one other, maybe it was at Rand Paul, it was like 97 to 2 in the end. So it wasn't even close, right? Um, and I think there's a couple of explanations there. Um, and I'll give some unsolicited advice <coughs> to industry friends here. Um, so so par a partial explanation of that was, as, as I sat there, um, you know, when you think about the equities on the table in that hearing room that day, and, and this was how I kind of stacked them up, I will say, and, and, and before I, I, I went live and testified, um, you had not insignificant equities. You had speech, very important. You had innovation. Let's be honest, you had some money on the table. Um, in that case, you also had ch children, dead children in many cases. And, and so to, to me, if you're a lawmaker, if you're, if you're a senator from, from any part of the country, some, those equities aren't close, right? And so on those edge cases, that's, that's what I saw going on in lawmakers' minds that day. So that's, that's SESTA. Um, it's a spectrum, right? And so there are these, these cases where it's very, very clear, and then we can move on down the spectrum. And then we can have an interesting conversation about the sort of the, the fact that these are dual-purpose technologies, and they can be forces for good. Sometimes they can be used to amplify the wrong thing. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, it's, it's, it didn't seem to me like it was close. Um, and the other thing I would say, point number two on, on that experience is, um, it's, you know, it's a, pr a process point, which is, um, you know, there was a moment in time where the, the Senate had, had done an investigation, a quite extensive investigation of Backpage. It, it closed the investigation. I think it had subpoenaed about a million pages of documents, it wrote up a very, I thought, well-written report um, that that evidenced back back pages conduct, um, and then this, the senators who were behind the report and the investigation called back page executives um, to a hearing, and they didn't show, right? And so think about all the process fouls that went into that, right? And this is this is about back page, but then after that, as it became a bigger issue for the industry, I, I will tell you that there were some. 
there was there was foot dragging going on. And so, so the point here is is and the advice, the unsolicited advice is, we need to start talking about this stuff now, and and let's start talking about it before the next, God forbid, terrorist attack where this becomes an issue, and um, emotions become inflamed, and um, and let's do it in a thoughtful way. Let's approach it with humility and so on. And I agree with all of the advice and all of the parameters that have been set by the other speakers. They know what they're talking about um, in, on First Amendment issues. They're, they're way ahead of me. Um, but I, I did have that personal experience. And so sort of um, being in the room where it happened, that's my, my feedback and advice. So there, there is will, given the right set of circumstances, to put additional holes into Section 230, which would perhaps regulate see, content. See, maybe if the engagement's different, you don't get there. I think in part what drove the, the outcome in SESTA was what I, I described, what I saw. Yeah. So, so Daphne, if they, if, let's say we do get there and you know, there is regulation, how, how fine a line do you think that Congress or other agencies can draw on this issue? Um, do you think that regulation is feasible or, or why wouldn't it be? Well, one reason it might not be is because of the First Amendment, right? Like we, we, we know from pre-internet um, pre cases, like cases about bookstores, for example, that there's a limit to how much liability you can put on an intermediary because of their natural incentive in response to over remove and to over enforce and to burden um, not their own speech rights, but the, the speech rights of the people who are trying to distribute books through them or, or access information through them. So, so we, we know there's a limit where if you screw up your intermediary liability laws badly enough, you, you are going to come up against the First Amendment. I, I actually think SESTA is on, is on that side of the line. Um, but you know, to go back to you know, can you do a better job that's this laundry list that I was talking about before of, of ways that experts in other countries, human rights officials have, have approached this that have a lot more you know, fine-grained differential treatment for different things. Okay, seeing as um, Henry pulled the trigger on the international component, and while I still have your attention, mm -hmm. um, I, I think one of the questions that I have is um, other countries don't have the First Amendment. And as far as branches of government goes, there seems to be will in Congress. The su Supreme Court seems to be super First Amendment friendly these days and getting more First Amendment friendly. Um, so maybe let's go into the, uh, the international realm. There are other rules, I think, I think Henry meant the German, German rule. Um, there are other ways that other countries are looking to um, force content moderation. And why have they been successful? And how, is that bad? Is that good? Is that a model? And how does that play out? So other countries don't have the First Amendment, but other countries do have case law on this question. And we know that laws that go too far and make intermediaries have to proactively monitor their users' speech and police it, for example, that violates the free expression rules in India, in Argentina, it went to the Supreme Court in both of those countries, and the uh, Court of Justice, or the European Court of Human Rights, also has a ruling on this, and that's under standards that are, you know, weaker than than the First Amendment. Um, in terms of models, I think I I would agree with with Henry's point that the sort of a good thing about Nets DG, I'm not a big fan of Nets DG, but a, a good thing is differential treatment for giant incumbent companies versus everyone else. It also that's the German law. Uh, it, it also has mandatory transparency reporting, which is really interesting. So there, there, there are some good things there. There are also some extremely bad things coming out of Europe right now. And I, I don't know if the next panel is going to get into this, but the, the terrorist content regulation, which will apply to platforms of any size, platforms outside of Europe, it says, when the authorities ask you to take something down and they say this is terrorism, you have to take it down in an hour. You have to have someone on the ground in Europe capable of taking it down in an hour. The authorities asking you to do it are not judges, they are probably police. Once you've taken it down, you have to build a filter to proactively detect and block things going forward. And we all know, there are those in, who work on this know that the terrorism filtering has a very bad history of, of overblocking. 
and you have an ongoing reporting relationship with local authorities where once a year you tell them how well your filters are working and they tell you if you need to do something else. So, you know, everything on that list, I would say, bad idea for, for internet laws. I mean, to, to that point, I mean, you can see two fundamental problems with it. One is the extra extraterritorial reach that Europe's trying to do, which, look, hate speech, yeah, well, I'll probably agree what that is on some level, but the idea that a foreign government can tell somebody in America to take down content that that foreign government or foreign entity deems to be offensive, maybe it insults the president or the leader of the country, maybe they consider it to be terrorist speech, or another person might consider it to be part of a... I'm going to go back to Arab Spring again. Uh, um, there are several other countries where this applies to more recently. So there is ample evidence and opportunity for abuse. On the issue of Section 230 writ large, I think one of the challenges we face in Congress, and it, it's terrifying for me to think about this, there are people up on the Hill who, who are not alive when Section 230 was signed into law. Uh, not legislators, but some of their staff. And Section 230 is just one of those things that we all take for granted. And it's one of those things that if it were gone, you would truly miss it. And we've all talked about Facebook and Twitter and Google and the big people here, and, and to point Daphne's point internationally. But I was talking to a colleague of mine earlier today, and I was mentioning how it would impact Eventbrite. It made Eventbrite possible. And she's like, Eventbrite? Why, why do they care about Section 230? I said, well, if I hosted a rager at my house and I put up the ad on Eventbrite, and let's say somebody burned down my house, then, or got hurt or tripped over a lamp, they could hold Eventbrite uh, partially responsible for the promotion of such a dangerous event. Section 230 gives you a, what's called a 12B6 motion to dismiss, kick that out. Uh, likewise, care.com, if all the parents in the room, like me, you know, imagine having a babysitter over. Do you think that a platform should be liable for everything that happens possibly on that platform? Now, care.com does a great job, but the liability is there. Medium's another example that I like to think of. They're facing lawsuits from people who read articles about ways to make it rich on Bitcoin, go out, buy a bunch of Bitcoin, lose a bunch of money, and then actually go and sue Medium for posting the article. So there are all these things on the internet, online, that we take for granted that you don't see coming internationally because they don't have these types of protections. And the idea of just kind of, we'll, we'll uh, you know, Swiss cheese section 230 where we see fit, I think gets away from a point that Daphne brought up earlier, which is if you see a harm, let's address it. Section 230 does not protect federal criminal law. If you engage in federal criminal law, that is not covered by section 230. So to the extent that there are horrible things happening, let's address them in the criminal code and not Swiss cheese away what makes the internet great here in America and likewise internationally. So rather than me being devil's advocate the entire time, maybe Henry, can we, can you can you say well? Can you be devil's advocate? Yeah, the, the future ex the, be, be a devil. Um, you know the future externalities that you know Carl is like you know we'll miss it when it's gone. Um, but are people like right now? People are like a lot of people are saying this kind of sucks. And um, so what what is being done right now, and what sh maybe more should be done um, going in that direction? Are we are, are, absent some type of regulation? Are we are we going to get there? Yeah, so um, a, a couple of thoughts on this. One is, um, I mean, to, to your point, Carl, about the, uh, the crim using the criminal code, right? I mean, I think, um, or the, the examples I used earlier of anti-discrimination law as it relates to housing or campaign finance law, these laws, we, we built them up and, they, and uh, there was expertise built around them. Um, for a reason, uh, because they represent what we believe is important to have a functioning uh, egalitarian democracy, right? And, um, and it was also important to help build the internet, um, you know, that, that uh, there was greater, um, you know, uh, maybe greater freedom at its, uh, at its beginning. Um, but now we've got to kind of figure out what's the next right balancing act. So if we use the, um, the German law as an example, what the German law does is, and again, I'm, I'm not advocating for the German law, but what the German do law does is it takes a series of things that are criminal, that were already criminal, 
in Germany and brings those to the internet. Uh, and there's good reasons to say why it works or why it doesn't work, but it takes existing criminal law and it brings it to the internet and says, as an internet uh, provider, a large internet provider, uh, not, I'm sorry, it's a wrong term, as a large social media uh, provider, um, you may not facilitate what would be criminal off the net, right? So I think there are, there are multiple ways, uh, I guess my answer would be, there are multiple ways to go at this, right? And um, uh, whether, and I think it, uh, the, the reason I started by saying what we're talking about are serious issues. The things we're trying to solve are not abstract. That is, uh, if we don't fix this, the implications are, uh, are potentially um, disastrous. So in sitting with the authors of the German law in, uh, in Berlin uh, and talking it through with them, what's clear is that, that the idea of the return of an extreme right in Germany is something they perceive, this is the conservative party, right, that's in charge, it's something that they perceive as a, a, uh, uh, a systemic threat to the ability for people to survive in a European democratic context. And they have history on their side on that, right? Like, it is a criminal act to, to, to declare that you're a Nazi uh, in Germany. It's a criminal act in Germany now to declare you're a Nazi online. It was always, uh, you know, criminal to do so in a bar. Now it's illegal online as well. Um, but the, the issue is now they're requiring that the internet companies do this. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm kind of fall somewhere in the middle. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. We need to understand that the implications of not fixing some of this is that uh, people will die, um, and, and it's that serious. Um, on the other hand, we need to figure out um, how we maintain uh, uh, new startups and competition, um, how we maintain uh, a, a, a robust set of ideas that challenge each other, which is essential in, in a democracy. Um, we need to figure out uh, what it is that will, uh, uh, that will make this um, uh, actually viable, um, consistent with the First Amendment. So um, I, I, I don't think there's a really easy answer here. That's why I think we're all kind of struggling with it. Um, but I do, I think we would probably um, at least the two of us, I think, would agree on this, that um, fundamentally we don't have access to enough information to figure out what works. Um, and so, therefore, it's very hard for us to say, if, if we recognize that there's going to be a balancing act, what path do we go down if we don't know whether that path even has any chance of working well, because we don't have transparency? Let's ask Daffy how much she agrees with Henry. Well, so I, I would ca just characterize the yeah. German law differently be because it was always the case that platforms had to take down anything on that list if, if they had knowledge about it. Mm -hmm. And and what NetsDG did was to accelerate the, the timeline for that. And, and put huge fines. And put huge fines. Um, although, interestingly, the, the fines is like, he, here you're worried about messing up one time and having a giant tort judgment. What they did there is the fines are for systematic noncompliance. Right. So it's it's a little bit more more nuanced in interesting ways. But the, the the thing that was already wrong with this knowledge, the knowledge standard for, for liability under European law going back to the e-commerce directive, which was passed in, in 2000, is nobody has any idea what what knowledge is. And what happens in real life is you're a platform, you get an accusation, you don't know if it's true or false, and the safest thing to do for sure is take it down. And this is the thing where we have just scads of empirical data, mostly from the copyright context, but copyright is relatively easy to look at it and say like, is this piracy or not? If you're talking about defamation or somebody, um, you know, anything that, that requires some kind of factual inquiry, platforms have no ability to do that. And, and so the, the knowledge standard is, has been really a problem in Europe. It also has the problem that existed before CDA 230, that if you're a platform, you have an incentive to not go looking for anything, to not try to moderate, 
because if you try to moderate and you miss something, you're going to get tagged with knowledge and you know, potentially lose a lawsuit over it. And this is something, you know, I talked to small platform operators in Europe and, and they, it is a problem for them. They're like, we want to moderate, we can't be commercially successful if we don't moderate, but we might lose some huge court judgment if we do moderate, because then we can be tagged with knowledge. And I think there would be a lot more European platform operators to tell you <laughs> that kind of story if they'd had a law like 230 in the first place. So um, we, have a, we have about 12 minutes left um, in this panel, at, sadly. Um, I, I'm going to go to the audience and any questions. There are so many great people on the audience. So any questions, um, I think we might have a microphone um, in the back. Um, any questions for the panel, uh, sir? If you can, um, Patricia, if you can identify yourself. And Can you hear me now? It's green. You okay. can use mine. Yeah. Tim, you can. You can <laughs> yeah, do you want to just. <laughs> sure. Why not? Yeah. I was going to bend over and be like, oh. <laughs> Tim Starks from The Price is Right, uh, Politico, actually. Um, uh, my question is related, it's related to this subject. Um, you talked about terrorism and content and, and how emotion can affect some of those subjects. The question specifically for Abigail. Um, are there any conversations going on with tech companies or um, Congress on encryption right now? And if so, what direction is the administration leaning? If there are, I'm not involved in them. Okay, that was the question, that was in it, okay, um, moving on. <laughs> um, so any other questions from the audience? Um, uh, uh, Ellery Biddle, Biddle in the back. Hi, my name is Ellery, I work with Global Voices. Um, anybody, Facebook is, has, is, has this new plan that they just dropped to build, I know they don't want to call it a Supreme Court, but whatever, the council thing that is going to, without independent experts who are going to deliberate on different types of content and whether it should stay on the platform or not, what do you think? Yeah, yeah there's, uh, there's several proposals. There's a, a Supreme Court. Um, there was a blog written recently from someone who used to work for me called They Should Have a Content Congress. Um, what do you think about those proposals? So, so I was uh, invited, I guess, a couple of days ago to participate in that. Uh, so I'm glad you described it because I was trying to figure out exactly what it was. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the issue, one of the reasons we wrote the policies that we wrote, uh, which is only going to partially answer your question, um, was because we thought it was important that civil and human rights organizations uh, begin to have this conversation on our terms and not only be responsive to mechanisms that um, large companies set up in order to engage um, on these issues. And so um, I think whenever these kinds of opportunities present themselves, I mean, there's also Facebook's audit, civil rights audit, for example. Um, I think it's always a challenge for us um, whether or not we should participate, frankly. Um, because uh, as opposed to um, saying, these are the rules uh, that we think are essential. This is what we've built up as knowledge over a uh, hundred years uh, as organizations in this country, um, and some of our member, you know, organizations go back that far, right? So, um, and so we want you to be responsive to this um, as an organizing principle um, is, uh, and probably there's somewhere in the middle, like participate. Um, so I guess I, I I don't have an answer. Is it the right thing? Is it the right approach? I do think that. Um, Look, these, particularly when you talk about um, Google and, and Facebook, right? Um, they have a significant amount of resources. They've invested that in fully engaging with um, the American political right and left um, in order to be able to uh, influ uh, influence and 
uh, influence us as lobbyists do, not just in this industry but in others, but influence us and influence the ways in which we engage with these issues. Um, even before there was any conversation about, a significant conversation about regulation. Um, and so I think it's always a balancing act as well to what extent should we participate in those things in order to, uh, you know, because are we being uh, pulled into a set of um, ways of thinking about the issues um, which are um, least likely to, to result in the outcomes that we'd like to see? I think everybody wants to weigh in on this question, but Gail also, Gail's has some like really interesting facial expressions um, that, <laughs> that <laughs> if you're... <laughs> I have a terrible poker face. So um, I'll do a, a gentle rebuttal about some of the assumptions that you're making about sort of who influences who. Um, the, you, I'll, I'll use the privacy um, discussion as the, the template because it's f much further along than this discussion. And we, we have an interagency process in place. And um, I, I will tell you, so just speaking for, for, for my part of a highly matrix organization, um, the, uh, we, first and foremost for us, uh, if, you know, if, as we develop uh, this, the privacy policy, is that this can't serve to build a regulatory mode around incumbents. And so that might not seem intuitive to you, I don't know, but that's not where we're coming from. Um, and and it, is, it should be intuitive because we're small business administration and, and it's really important to us. It's also important to the colleagues at the FTC, throughout the FTC, that, that this regulation can't stand in the way of competition. Of course, they have that dual mission and so they think about both missions and give both equal weight. Um, so just to clarify a little bit, tidy up the record there. Can I just pick up on, on Gail's point about who influences who? Be, because there's, um, uh, I, I have a paper I just finished that's coming out today or tomorrow through Hoover and through, through Lawfare that, that is about this question of um, platform, own, owners of huge platforms as information gatekeepers, right? Like, is it a problem? Here, it's, here it, in DC, it's a conservative bias conversation. Is it a problem that platforms are um, el eliminating content or users in, in a way that's seen as biased against political conservatives. Same question comes up across the political spectrum globally. Like people right. in Brazil raise it as an indigenous rights issue. Uh, in France, there was a case that raised it as an issue of a right to po post uh, what we would consider pornographic art. Um, you know, ev everybody wants to say, hey, these gatekeepers are so powerful and, and they are running something like an essential facility. It's so big, I have a right to be on it. Um, that's a really important question. I dive very deep on the law of that in, <laughs> in the paper, if you're looking for that. But on the other side of that, there's an issue of platforms exercising their discretion in a way that's actually a vector for other power that influences them, and most significantly, a, a vector for state power, for, for the power of governments. And we see it happening most conspicuously in Europe, but it's sort of, there's this conjoined set of issues about platform power and about government power that we are not looking at together, and the failure to look at the two of them together is leaving us in a situation where it's very, very hard to define what users' rights are, speech rights, in, in any situation. So I think this sort of who is influencing who is a really good way to put the question, and we, we need to look at the big picture. Yeah, just on that quickly, and, and so, I mean, we're very cognizant of that in developing our policies because particularly when we looked at communities of color um, and the criminal justice system, and the ability for, for, say, a sheriff's department or a police department to influence a platform um, about what got taken down, that sort of thing, was, uh, was something we, we simply felt like was a serious, uh, I mean, m most of our organizations had actually represented uh, activists in this space um, and with these kinds of concerns. So I, I, I think this is a really, in some other venue, a, a really important conversation that we need to figure out, not just at the uh, federal level, but particularly at the local level where most people interact with government. I'm going I'm to ask Carl to forbear on this, this question, if that's okay, and get to like the lightning round of questions. And answers like um, Gail gave, or the, la the, the uh, question no. before last, like yes, yeah. no, maybe, possibly, <laughs> uh, lightning round. I think there's a question with Alex here and the gentleman in the front row, and, uh, and we'll try to get to Rick in the back. Lightning round, because we only have a few minutes left. Patricia? Oh. 
Uh, yep, a uh, long time caller, a uh, first time asker. Uh, so uh, you talked about responsibility. On the uh, tech side, if you see a elected leader, uh, say a president, engaging in dehumanizing language, um, calling for mass genocide, for instance, is there a responsibility for uh, the platform to step in? Um, let's say you have someone describing immigrants that way or uh, leading a hate movement against the press. Um, on the other side, um, if a government becomes aware that a platform is being used for genocide, uh, say Myanmar or something like that in the future, is there a responsibility for the government to step in and intercede? Light, so, lightning round. It, it, will be, it will depend on what the platform decides is best for its users. If it wants to remove that content because it finds it objectionable, Section 230 lets them do that. If they want to leave it up because they recognize it's a human atrocity that the government's trying to take down, Section 230 lets them do that as well as our First Amendment. Okay, other answers. I mean, some of this sounds like it could be criminal and fall within a loophole to 230 for, for federal crimes. It's going to be super different in different countries. As I think I understand your question, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. And, 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 get, and you want to go on? Next question? Yeah. Okay, next question. Okay. Rick. <laughs> Rick. Gail's not doing the hypothetical. Real, you don't have to provide a lot of context. Just get to the yeah. question. Um, I worked uh, on the FOSTA SESTA legislation organizing, and I feel your pain of what you had to go through. <laughs> it was tough. Um, very quickly, there's a lot of discussion on revising Section 230, not getting rid of it, as some would like to articulate, but having some type of modifications to it. Um, the concern of the groups that I work with, the anti-human trafficking groups, is that the treaty agreements have language, Section 230 language in it, that could hinder those conversations within the U.S. Congress um, and the administration. And I'm wondering if others share that concern. So, uh, so this is a reference to USMCA, NAFTA 2.0, and there's a provision in there that looks awfully like 230 and that creates an obligation to adopt into domestic law, something that looks like 230 to the extent it doesn't exist. Um, I, I, I'm going to have to punt on that simply because that's just not my wheelhouse. I international trade is not my wheelhouse. Um, but I do know there, there, there are discussions. I know groups like yours have, have talked to the White House about this. Sorry. I mean, my, my sense was that m m my people greatly overclaimed victory on that one. Like, as I read the NAFTA language, it was full of wiggle room, and, and I don't really think that Canada and Mexico would have signed on without the wiggle room. So I've, I'm, I'm not sure how much of a there 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 is. And, and I see that argument as a total red herring. Uh, rarely have we let stuff in trade agreements preclude discussions here domestically. Okay, that was a great lightning round. I am sorry we're running out of time, but hold on. So the next panel is gonna be moderated by Liz Woolery from CDT. Um, she's amazing, she has a great panel, including Ellery who spoke just a second ago, and it's, it's gonna sharpen the pencil on this issue to look at political discourse. So the same issue, but just narrowing it down to political discourse. I wanna thank this amazing panel, I thank all of you, and we'll see you right back. Thank you, Tim.